Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Moonbase podcast. On this episode, we have Sham returning and we discuss stealth camping, urban exploring, dealing with cops, crossing the border, and a whole lot more. Um, be sure to check out the Moonbase Patreon the YouTube channel, you can just look up the moon base on YouTube and you'll find it. And yeah, any support, uh, like and review the podcast that helps us get more views. I'm currently in like a more stable situation, so I'm going to put more content out there. And if you want to see videos that are different from the normal podcast content, the YouTube channel would be the place to look for that. And yeah, that's all from me. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Love finds a way. Introducing Digit State, where sparks fly even if fingers don't. Missing a few fingers, but not missing out on love? Join Digit State, the hottest dating site for those who've left a piece of themselves at work. Swipe right with confidence, because here at Digit State, we know that true love is about connecting on a deeper level, literally. Whether you've lost a pinky or said farewell to a thumb, we've got a match for you. Our unique algorithm ensures that you'll find someone who won't finger point at your past accidents, but will hold your hand, or what's left of it, through thick and thin. From hand holding to high fives, our members have perfected the art of love without a full set of fingers. Prosthetic? No problem. We embrace all shapes and sizes, even if they come with a few less digits. Sign up today and we'll throw in a free love grip compatibility test. Discover who can hold hands with you without feeling like they're playing Twister. Don't let workplace accidents give you the cold shoulder. Warm up to Digit State and let love bloom one finger at a time. Join now and show the world that when it comes to romance, you've got the upper hand. Digit State, because love is all about finding the missing pieces. Hey, how's it going? Hey, man. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I'm doing uh, doing solid. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Sorry about the uh, late time there. Oh, no worries for me. I mean, the fact is you're three hours ahead, and uh, it's always going to be much earlier for me, so that's no worries. But like I was saying, I'm a night owl, and I'm glad to be able to chat anyways, uh, because as you probably know, being a vagabond is generally lonely, and I'll take whatever chance I can get to uh, chat it up. Yeah, for let sure. Me know whenever you want to start the podcast, or no, I was gonna say, let me know whenever you want to officially start the podcast. Oh yeah, we're we're rolling. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so for me, I've just been up to my usual. I'm working, grinding, trying to save up some money so I can continue down the journey. The plan is still to go to Oregon sooner or later. Uh, and then just kind of go from there. I'm chilling here under these office buildings that I found. It's been, it seems to work out the last couple of weeks. I've got a nice cover, just started raining a little bit, you know, Pacific Northwest, rainy area of the nation. So real thankful for this. Wi-Fi works great. Um, thankfully my buddy is giving me access to his, uh, it, like hotspots. And I'm able to tap into this uh, network here and immediately access. And I, I sent you a picture. I just saw an owl, I think, for the first time in my life. Kind of said, went to go take a piss and I look up to what the hell is this thing? First, I thought it was like a cat or maybe a raccoon because they're pretty common just running around here. But to see an owl was a pretty trippy and, and, and cool sight uh, for sure. That's kind of where I'm at. Um, just a quick kind of shout out to myself. Uh, I am Sham, I A M S H A M, the man on all social media. If you want to follow me, if you want to see an article, go ahead and Google Sham, S H A M Belt Magazine. 
to check that out. And of course, you know, please tune in to this podcast. Check out all the guests. They're amazing. I've been going through some of them. And you're just going to get like the most kind of honest, in-depth view as to what this lifestyle is all about. And then, and uh, for me, I say, yeah, that's basically it. Just kind of maintaining my course. But of course, still planning to move forward. And uh, day by day, I think that's really the best way to look at this lifestyle is you're just living in the moment, treasure it, try to make the most out of it, and, and be positive. Great, on What's uh, in Oregon? What's got you going I mean, there? I mentioned early, yeah, the, there's so much you know going on with your podcast and stuff, but I think I mentioned it in one of the podcasts, but I'm from Oregon. I'm from Corvallis, Oregon. And I have a friend there, and unfortunately, his, his mom's going through a terminal cancer situation, and she's like an aunt to me. So I'm waiting for that phone call um, as you know things naturally worsen, unfortunately, to a point where it'll be you know time for me to kind of go down there and do my thing, spend some time with him, with his family, who I've grown up with, his brother is a friend as well. Uh, and that'll mean leaving Seattle, Washington, which I'm at right now, and progressing the journey. That journey could go down to L.A., uh, could, could go up to Canada where you're at. There's many options, uh, but I definitely want to do more train hopping. I want to get a sense of kind of each sector of the nation doing train hopping. Uh, that's just kind of the, the, the general outline moving forward. As, as you know, as any vagabond knows, things can change. Two years ago, on October 10, 2021, when I first set off on this journey, when I officially became homeless, and I've done vagabonding before as a road tripper, going across the country six times in 2021, kind of getting a sense of stuff. But with a car, rubber tramping, there's more stability, there's more security and whatnot. I don't know if you're going to get the full experience, but I was kind of forced into it. Well, I was forced into it on November 10, 2021 in Detroit when my car broke down in route to moving to Vegas from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, but you have this general plan. It's like, oh, I'm going to go here. I'm going to restart my life and whatever. And things don't work out. You have to learn how to roll with the punches. And that's the biggest lesson when I talk about trial by fire and just taking things as they are only looking at the next step, which I'm only going to preach stoicism as focusing on the present, present being a gift, um, and just looking at the positive in everything. So I kind of have a general plan, but I'm not going to commit to it, because once you have expectations, you're open to disappointment, and I'm, I've learned that that's just not the best route. It's just not the best philosophy to look into is, you should try to never be disappointed and just try to make the most of what's going on. And I think, you know, Oregon tentatively is, is going to be the next plan. And from there, I'm open. Just have, I think it's good to have general ideas, a general game plan, but just don't put much weight into it. Just look at everything, the world as, as an experience or a potential destination and you go with your gut um, and just, just learn how to trust that. As you gain more experience, your gut is going to become more accurate. But regardless, sometimes it's kind of fun to just say, you know, fuck it. Whatever happens, like, oh, sometimes you almost wish, like, the worst case scenario happens because it has excitement and you get to see yourself being tested. That's why I don't really worry too much about the future. Do you think that that had a role to play into, like, a bunch of people that devoted themselves to, like, God and stuff like that, like, saints and the such just becoming pretty much vagabonds? Uh, sorry, could you rephrase that? Like, uh, like, if you look in history, like, a bunch of the saints and stuff like that in uh different religions were vagabonds do you think that not having an expectation and just rolling with the punches has a role in that yeah i i could definitely see that it's it's that's the funny thing is that we glorify these people that we would look down upon right now in terms of the their socioeconomic status <laughs> like these people dressed in rags, kind of, even the philosophers, you know, dressed in rags, roaming the streets, being very opinionated, 
doing whatever they want, not caring about judgment, roaming around, and we would look down upon them. But I think, um, like, there's a real freedom in, like, there's, there's a sort of, like, respect you have to give somebody who's willing to, to endure that, because you're enduring all this hardship and toughness and stuff like that. Um, so, so, sorry, could you just repeat the question one more time? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just, like, curious if, like, what your thoughts on people and, like, sainthood or, like, philosophers, how the role of being a vagabond plays into that, because they don't really have any expectations. Um, oh, that's what they get for, yeah. Um, um, there was this one Roman, I think, a philosopher where he would just eat out of a dog bowl and like live under a bridge or something like that and then the roman emperor came to him and asked him like he he was saying like yeah i have like control over the whole empire like what is it that you want and the guy was just telling him that he wants him to move over a step or two because he's blocking the sun and he's just trying to sit in the sun <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what his name is. I should know, but I'll oh, look it up. Yeah, no, that, oh, for sure, that's awesome. Um, I think in terms of that, there's something attractive about maybe somebody who's really new, who doesn't expect much, because maybe they don't have expectations on you. It releases a certain type of pressure if you're dealing with somebody. Um, who just totally accepting of, of whatever it is. Um, because ex expectations can be a burden, and if you're around somebody who's very kind of, I don't know, militaristic or, or overly demanding, structured and stuff, you're not going to feel comfortable. Therefore, why would you want to tag along with that person? Why would you want to listen to them? Um, so the fact that you have somebody, you know, these saints or whatever, who are going around essentially being vagabonds, Maybe it's more relatable in a sense because you look at the freedom. It's and we all seek that, and you're reviewing the physical manifestation of that in you know, a vagabond being somebody who really is free. And you're thinking, okay, let me see what the insight they have because it seems attractive. Let, how do they do this? What are things that they believe in? Like, what are some tips and tricks and all of that stuff? Um, I think we all have like our soul wants to wander naturally and find some sort of truth. But I think truth is so ever shifting that maybe a natural tendency is at times to, to really want to explore the spectrum and put yourself out there. So for a figure to come along and say, Hey, listen, like I'm just going to go with the flow and, and do whatever I'd like. I could see that being really appealing. And, and again, that's, at the same time, you can also incorporate this into a cult. A lot of these cult figures are, are, are the same way. You know, it's, there's a certain just like pull and appeal to somebody who's, who kind of has an I don't give a shit attitude uh, and goes for whatever they want. Yeah, for sure. You were mentioning uh, r slash vagabond too, and you we're saying that you had a few things you wanted to talk about regarding that. Yeah, I think so for me, I think Reddit has been the most amazing place and Vagabond stands out as a group. It's the most, it's, it's a group I identify with the most just because of that's how I'm living, you know, but I see more so, and again, whenever I say things, it's not to criticize and also everything is a case by case basis. So if I seem like I'm speaking about you or, you know, speaking on you or whatever, that's not the case because I don't know your entire case. Um, just a kind of a generality of speaking in, in general terms that a lot of it just, it seems to be watered down and rather basic as opposed to broadcasting, you know, these adventures and really deep thoughts and philosophies of vagabonding, it's more of just the basic superficial, hey, this is what I ate. Um, I, here's my whatever. You're like, 
there just seems to be too much of a, of a basic approach to it. And just speaking with some of the, you know, old heads, OGs, whatever, I, I can see certain issues behind that because it's more so you just advertising kind of their struggles and there's more of like a downtrodden negative vibe about it, uh, which I don't think should be the common thing. And there seems to just be the same old repetitive type posts over and over again. Like, let's get some sort of deep discussions going. Why are you doing this? This and that. Um, big adventures. You know, go go and do something. Try to do something epic and, and broadcast that. Uh, if you do need help, I think it'd be cool to... You can DM me anytime you want. I am Shan the Man. Uh, if you're going through some struggles and stuff. But to constantly broadcast struggles and stuff, it just seems kind of counterproductive. It kind of takes away from from the thrill of it all, uh, and it just kind of fulfills that stereotype of, oh, you know, I'm suffering and this and that, and, you know, I think we need to return to more depth and more adventure, um, and kind of lean on more of the experienced people out there and, and try to extract some knowledge. That, for me, is the most intriguing part. And yeah, I could say maybe I'm biased, but I did build myself to this level. I was, at one point, a dude sitting in his living room in the dark getting drunk watching people explore, you know. I, I waited until I, I extracted knowledge from that, you know, via videos, did my own thing, and once I got established in that, then I started broadcasting myself. Um, so it, it'd be cool to have, you know, interactions more so where kind of the people who have been there, done that, are able to, to help those out, you know. Um, also, there's a lot of talk of people wanting to kind of rush into being a vagabond, romanticizing it. it. It's a dangerous approach. I totally understand why you want to do it. I don't blame you. After all, I've done it myself. I mean, I can't, we all came from that. But you have to realize what an end goal is. Uh, and I always going to refer to it as a phase. I don't think this is a lifestyle. Uh, I believe a lot of people, almost everybody does because they're searching for something. And a lot of that has to do with mental health issues. We've almost all universally gone through a struggle and we're trying to, to figure shit out. And going out into the world and experiencing freedom seems like the solution. It's like a cure-all therapy. We automatically take it as a therapy. And do we ever consider that it could actually worsen our condition? Because if you're suffering in your present life of being housed, and within society, so to speak, what's to say that going out into these rough elements, you're being exposed to rough people as well, um, into all these unscripted scenarios, how, how you're going to react to a point where it's actually going to make you better? Like, these are things we don't consider. We don't consider the, the, um, the rougher aspect of being a vagabond, uh, because it's very easy... Uh, in moment of weakness, which you will get a lot of moments of weakness. I'm somebody who I've wrestled for a top college. I was an amateur MMA champ. I'm one of those guys people look at, they might be like, man, this guy is hardened. Um, you know, he's a manly man more so, or whatever you want to call it. I go through those struggles myself. You know, I've been through some hellish situations, just training and growing up real rough, real rough and poor and beaten and abused and stuff like that. And there's moments when I want to quit. I, I mean, I never will, but it's just as being a human, it's going to come into your mind, and you might start thinking some darker thoughts. Or maybe you might take somebody up on an offer, and who knows that person's intention, or who knows what that person might drag you into. And before you know it, you could very easily end up being an, uh, a homeless addict on the street with diminished health, and really no chance to, to ever return to society or to build yourself to a point where you're actually really enjoying life. Those are the pitfalls that they need to be mentioned, especially with all the recent trends of more so negative suffering downtrodden posts. Um, with, with newbies, you know, introducing themselves, which I appreciate. If you're a newbie, reach out, whatever, but it's just, more of the repetitive, um, you know, suffering thing that I'm just not on board with. You know, that's when you've got to kind of rely on the people who've been there and done that. 
uh, and, and so to speak. And also you have to realize maybe it's not for you, or at least not for you in that particular point, that it's better as shitty societies might be to remain within it uh, for the safety measures. So I say, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of people reach out to me, and a lot of them being, you know, um, women in tough situations, for example. They're stuck in a tough situation in society. I want to explore, I want freedom, I want to escape and stuff, and it sucks. But the reality is that if you are a single woman and you want to be a vagabond, I, I highly discourage it for your own safety. You're fully exposed, not just to the elements, but to the worst elements of society. Because in general, you have to consider, you have to ask yourself, why is this dude out here living, you know, like this? Uh, not, not in, you know, not even to mention the home bombs and stuff like that. This person very well maybe have mental health issues or criminal past or whatever, and you're going to face a moment of weakness or you're going to be approached and it's going to be very easy to take somebody up on an offer of, hey, come camp or let me let me take care of you or something like that. And now you're in a situation where it's worse than before. So certain populations, like I would say, single women, especially younger ones who don't have even any outdoor experience, to say, listen, like my life, my life sucks. I'm stuck here and whatever. I just I need to be free. Therefore, I want to be a vagabond. I, I don't think it's a smart approach. I can understand the rationale, but maybe the idea is to try to find resources within society to better you in that way, to get you to a point of stability, as opposed to just running out into the open. Um, you know, and obviously, if you have any sort of like major health issues, I would also recommend against that. I'm always going to go back to mental health. Why? Because I suffer from it. I get treated. But that's the difference is that I recognize that within myself and I was proactive enough to do that. And then I combine it with vagabonding as a sort of therapy. Plus, I come from a unique background of already being established within society and having gone through, you know, exploring the outdoors and survivalism and stuff like that. Um, that's why I say it's a case-by-case -case basis. I don't want anybody to get rubbed the wrong way or offended. You know, just generalities, but if, you know, you're, you're uh, a woman, single woman, especially younger, if you're going through um, mental health issues and stuff like that, I would greatly advise you against doing this, and unless you found a very trusted partner to go into it. Plus, you're just exposing yourself to potentially some of the worst elements out there, and there's a very big chance that you may totally worsen your overall condition. I believe vagabonding is positivity, uh, and it should improve you. It should be an overall uh, great experience. And if it's not going to be that, it's like, what's the point then? Like I've said before, if you don't like it, don't fucking do it. It's that simple. If, uh, if you're struggling through that, there needs to be changes in your own life. It's up to you to figure out what those changes need to be. But try to improve your situation within society, as much as you can before vagabonding uh, so that you can also use vagabonding as a way to improve as a form of therapy. But don't just really will it and say, hey, I'm going to be a vagabond and it's this cure-all romanticized thing. You're going to be greatly disappointed and it sucks. It really pisses me off, you know, the evil people out there, but um, you may very well have put yourself into an even worse situation. So I'm, you know, praying for everybody. But again, reach out to me whenever you'd like. These are just kind of like basic guidelines to follow. And I believe everything like this, as as you know, dramatic as vagabonding can be, has to have a disclaimer. And I'm just here to kind of share my own thoughts on this. Yeah, I think a lot of the people that really romanticize it. If I could give them, like, any advice, it would be to just grab a sleeping bag and, like, a pack and then find, like, a stairwell or something and just sleep on the concrete pad under the stairs for a night. And now is a good time, too, because it's cold, but it's not too cold. But I feel like even just having a taste of, like, an actual night on a cold concrete pad in the cold would be 
like a pretty good taste of what a lot of the experience is like, you know? Oh, yeah. I totally agree. And I think I did mention this before. I I think a natural progression is best. You should have watched many, many videos on Vagabond League before considering it. And I absolutely recommend being a rubber tramp, meaning being traveling in a car and experiencing it that way. Using your weekends, like you say, to go outdoors and to camp in that manner. So you're dabbling while still having a solid foundation, a uh, comfortable foundation to go back into, and you're testing yourself. So I'd rather do these small tests to really see you know, where your intentions and skills are at before doing it. You're totally right. Uh, and hey, maybe even on the weekends, go walk around the rough part of town, expose yourself to the home bombs, because they're, they're the most likely ones to give you trouble. See how you handle it, see what the vibe is, and go from there. But there should be a series of progressions. You know, like I went from watching a video to being a road trip or having access to a car. Then I finally started living out of my pack, you know. Um, but to go from essentially being stuck in a bedroom with no survival skills, having not really roughed it at all, being in a vulnerable position, like I mentioned, the, the population I was speaking of, uh, women, especially younger women and those with struggling with mental health issues or other health issues, just jumping in there is, is, is misguided. You know, and I can understand the appeal because I've been in those situations growing up where I'm like, fuck, I just, I don't know if I want to see tomorrow. Like, it's that bad. I feel like it's that bad. I don't even want to wake up. So what's the risk of just going out into the world and effing it? Like, what could be worse? Well, it's sick to say this, but worse could be getting murdered or raped, um, being, getting into addiction and, and, and ending up being a zombie. Like, we see these people walking around, babbling, hunched over, disheveled, and we forget that these people at one point were "quote unquote" normal. You know, uh, they have a they have a, a past. They, they came from something that was better. How did this occur? Well, there's many factors, but that's a natural kind of progression I see happening if if things don't go or are planned the right way. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot of elements you got to watch out for when out on the street. Uh, uh, rubber tramping's, like, pretty much how I, like, got more serious about it, too. I went down to Texas with a SUV and a trailer. So you went from, uh, did you go from Canada to Texas? Yeah. Just drove uh, along the east coast and then back up along the middle, so like Ohio and nice. stuff like that. Yeah, it was a good introduction. It was it was interesting, um, especially when it got colder too, because there was a point where it like the condensation from my breath and would like freeze onto the inside of the trailer like going back oh, up yeah. so it was just interesting oh, so like so you, had an SUV, so you had an suv with a trailer you were towing a trailer and suv and then you would sleep in the trailer yeah exactly nice that's awesome did you have like um access like did you rig it up to have some sort of power or amenities so there was the trailer had its own system for like it had a washroom, it had like a kitchenette and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah. you you had to fill up the tank for it and then everything else ran off batteries. So what I would do is at night I'd so you could sleep in Cracker Barrel parking lots or Walmart parking lots. And then every night I'd like go look around for outdoor outlets. So look for like businesses with well-kept lawns and whatnot and then they usually have landscaping outlets and then i just leave like a duffel bag with two car batteries in it and then i just have my car battery charger to charge them outside and then i had a water key so i'd open like a city water 
like outlet or whatever, the outdoor ones. And uh, then I just fill up those like water cooler jugs that they use in like offices. And then if I carried like five or six of those, it'd be a full water tank in the trailer. So are these these keys, are they like those generic ones you might be able to purchase like off Amazon? So it's the same fitting. The only thing is that I found like the handle for a spigot pretty much just on the ground in a parking lot. And that one fit most of them Uh, perfectly. Yeah, it makes sense. Like speaking of those landscaping outlets and stuff, I mean, I'm an electrician, so uh, it's perfect. You know, I've installed some of those and stuff. And, and I talk about increasing awareness, like how your awareness gets increased being a vagabond. And one of them is finding resources, especially electrical sources. And I, I believe my eyes are very tuned to that, naturally being an electrician, but also being a vagabond and needing access to power sources. I'm always scanning. And I always have destinations uh, where I can plug in. Obviously, uh, Power Pack, especially a big one, I would highly recommend any Vagabond. That should be like one of those essential purchases is get a good Power Pack, uh, something heavy duty just in case. Um, what else? Uh, for example, like in parks, they've got utility boxes on the ground at times. And if you get you know, a socket wrench, you should be able to open one up and they've got breakers in there and then you can turn on power to the shelters, the power to the outlets in the shelters. So there's little tricks like that. That's why when you mentioned it, I was thinking that, uh, you know, you can basically just, if you see an attachment, you're, you're able to get that and, and that's a key um, to be able to access stuff like that. So there's, that's cool you mentioned that these are little like tips and tricks to be able to access different resources outdoors when you mentioned walmart it's funny because i mean it's just one of those things that comes up on youtube when you talk about car camping and stuff like that uh how long ago was that that you accessed walmart um about like a year now okay i was just gonna say that Walmart was like a universal good location, but at least here in the U.S., from what I've seen, um, because I've tried to do it myself, they've hired security almost like every Walmart I've seen, they have like Bronson security, some third-party security company that patrols their parking lots and trucks. So I don't know how feasible that is. Um, That's why I recommend against Walmart at this point because they seem to have really stepped up their security or else that used to be like the ultimate destination. Uh, well, some outside. of them have RV parking. Outside convenience stores. What is that? Some of them have like RV specific parking. Like they, oh, okay. they're they set up I, I like uh, Cracker Barrel. Oh, I see. Yeah, parking lots are definitely... Yeah, it's, it's, it's feasible. I just wanted to kind of give a mention for people a heads up that many Walmarts, basically all of them I've seen across the country within the last two years have really upgraded security on uh, in half patrol vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, when I was down in the States, I saw a lot of, uh, like, the lot cops, those, like, robot yeah. stands there and like every once in a yeah, while you'd yeah, hear it go yeah. off at night that someone got too close to the Walmart or whatnot. Yeah. One recommendation I have in terms of parking lots, if you go on Google and type in businesses for lease or rent, you'll come to these commercial websites, uh, the commercial property websites. Uh, and these are like big business parks or big office buildings that are being up for lease or rent. And the parking lots are, are empty. Um, I, I, for me, like, I don't have, again, expectations. You try them out. If you get caught, you get caught. But I've had a lot of luck at searching up um, commercial properties. And sometimes them being businesses and offices and stuff, they'll have outdoor outlets as well. Uh, and you can usually maybe find a nook or cranny to, to get into. But I've had success with commercial properties. Uh, that's something else I would look into in terms of uh, parking lots, the camping and stuff like that.
Okay, yeah, that's good advice. I'd never really thought of that, but that seems solid. Yeah, like my, my business parts. Yeah, I've had a lot of like the business parts. You know, and you're getting their address and information off the website and stuff like that. But you use Google Satellite View, which is the ultimate resource tool. Google Satellite View, and just kind of check the the, the settings and maybe see where you can sneak your car. I've even parked my car off. Like off road, so to speak, to hide behind bushes and things like that. I did that actually, probably my riskiest one, <laughs> and was at uh, an elementary school. Uh, I forget where, but I took my car off roading and like went tricking back behind the playground. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I parked my car. Yeah, I parked my car there, and then I slept behind it, so I was still hidden. And then I had a wireless security system. Uh, it went off sensors. I put the beat, the beat, like the uh, detector next to me, and it can detect up to like 300 feet. And I would position my wireless sensors at every entrance. Uh, and then when I would hear that, I'd obviously wake up, but I, you know, I'd still be hidden and give me a heads up. The idea at the time was not even to be able to escape, but just to have yourself ready for the encounter. Um, that's another thing. If you go on Amazon and you search wireless security system, it's sort of by ideal. I D E A L, and they're meant for you know, like to be mounted. They're these little boxes. They're meant to like, be mounted and stuff. But I, you can position them in a way to make them work uh, for that application, even though it's not designed for that. But that's what I would do as my general setup. It, and technically, it opened up everything to me. But I even was going off roading in, in schools to camp back behind buildings in the grass, driving my car there, and then having a detection setting, uh, just giving me a heads up. Obviously, don't do it during school days, you know, or anything like that. Uh, but having a wireless system is another thing to kind of consider. Yeah, that kind of reminded me of the one guy that posted on r slash Vagabond that was saying he wanted a trail cam to put up on a tree like facing his camp and everyone was like I guess if it makes you feel safer but it's not really gonna help you like you're just gonna have a picture of you getting robbed you know exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah so I've, I've I've used those I have a video I haven't posted it yet uh, of me describing the security system because when I went to Corvallis my hometown a couple years ago uh, another good place is electrical substations, especially if they're um, on a you know down a dirt path. Generally, they don't like they don't need to be maintained regularly. You're not going to have a technician going there often unless there's an issue, like the power grid down or maintenance or whatever. Uh, and again, I keep reminding people: worst case scenario, people are just going to tell you to get the f out of there, and that's it. But at least you got a full night's sleep. Work is not going to start until 7 or 8, and then you just get out. But I set up my wireless system down this gravel road, and it's only in one way. Therefore, I'm always going to be able to detect any movement. Uh, so I did that. Um, you know, I set it a couple hundred feet down the road near, near the entrance. Um, and that's just another kind of tip. Electrical substations, uh, if you find them with, like, a... Uh, a driveway leading up to them, and they're kind of tucked back. That's another good good option right there. Yeah, I used to. If you're afraid of that, if you're afraid of electrical signals or anything like that, just wrap yourself in tin foil and you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just make sure you don't use microwaves. Those are the real dangerous ones. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I used to, like, go mountain biking down those dirt paths, and no one would really bother you at all. It's a pretty good setup. Yeah. I've got an, a ton of interesting urban camping setup. And that's a part of vagabonding that I think uh, is exciting for me, just to come up with, like, being a rubber tramp is such, like, it's such a different, unique experience for me. In a way, I enjoy it better because I'm able to access like more diverse things and I'm able to have a fuller experience, I believe. But but like 
hey, how do I find the campsite? Do the satellite review. Okay, I'm going to drive my car here. I'm going to position my car here. Like, I'll take stuff out of my car and make a little fort barrier out of it. Uh, it's almost like I'm pretending to be some sort of soldier setting up, you know, a defense system or something like that. Um, I had a one-person tent as well that was really cool to use. That's another cool thing um, to have. Uh, it was just like a fillable one-person tent. That served me really well, especially when it was raining weather elements. Other than that, I just like to sprawl out in the open, have a, a small, like a one or two inch memory foam uh, mattress stopper, and just roll that out and sleep out in the open. Uh, but I always like to keep hidden, and that's why I position my car and whatever material I have to be able to stay hidden. And again, things aren't about being caught, it's about being ready for the encounter. Um, you just have to accept that you're going to be caught here and there. I've had dozens of law enforcement encounters. They've all been chill. We've mentioned this before. You never sit with your attitude. If you, you laugh things off, like a couple of days ago, I was caught by the cops because I was sleeping in a nearby parking garage and I knew I was going to be caught, but I was so tired, I figured, let me just get some a couple hours of rest, right? And yeah. I wake up. And got this light shining in my face, and I wake up just laughing in their face, and then you see them smile. <laughs> it's, how can you not laugh at some lunatic sleeping in a sleeping bag in a parking garage, just waking up in that sort of manner? And they see you as non-threatening, and you apologize, tell them we're going to leave right away, and stuff like that. I always like to just kind of make a joke out of it, and say, yeah, you guys caught me, you know, and... uh I'm just here. I'm taking advantage. No big deal. I'm going to be out of here, and you'll never see me again. And it, it works out. So don't limit yourself by the fear of being caught. Um, Do they run your name? No, they didn't even ask for my ID. Nothing. Huh. I really, really, I, yeah, I really, really believe that if you're uh, lighthearted about it and you're automatically... Um, non-confrontational that you fully agree like I'm going to leave there's no need for them to do that because you have to look at it from their perspective they need to do work by filling out paperwork by doing X, Y, Z they're exerting effort they'd rather not exert effort if they don't need to um, and even if they like run your name and stuff like that I mean I don't have anything to hide I'm not going to volunteer it actually my default I mean, what I would suggest is to say, hey, I don't have my ID, and it's believable. So, hey, you're a vagabond, you're homeless, so it's very well likely that you lost it or, or whatnot. That's just my general default, and I've never had issues saying that, because ultimately they just want you to leave. There's really nothing deeper than that. We, we kind of tend to, to build things in our brain as being overly dramatic. It's a simple situation. You're not supposed to be sleeping here. As long as you get up and leave, there should be no further issues. That's it? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And maybe also, um, I don't know, this, there could be a certain psychology behind how you portray yourself as well. So, I mean, I wear, I like to display the American flag. I mean, I'm patriotic, I believe in the country and that one the best for it and stuff like that. A lot of times the establishment, police uh, and whatnot, they have like this negative connotation that you're counterculture and you just want destruction of society and they might treat you rougher because of it. You're too rebellious. You might appear that way. I like to explain, I mean, the American flag and keeping myself clean cut like we mentioned before. I think that goes a long way in just Teasing them when they see that this person is not out here to just, you know, be a thorn on the side of society. And, and again, which I mentioned before, I don't cater to the F society mentality. Uh, that could put them at ease. So there's little maybe psychological tricks we can incorporate, such as appearing very patriotic, uh, keeping clean cut, not disheveled, which helps ourselves as well, health wise. Those 
appearance just goes a long way. So look for psychological uh, toys to be able to use at your disposal. Yeah, I found who, uh, yeah, anything like that. Like if you have a flag of the country or for me, like the uh, previous service has come in handy a lot. Like I've been arrested exactly. and whatnot. You mentioned that, and they're already like, oh, okay, I'm part of this reservist group, and blah, blah, blah. Like, what did you do? What, you know? Yeah, I, I'd almost put, like, in a way, I'd almost display myself to be as conservative as possible. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Not, even if you're not, the establishment in general, the enforcement arm of the establishment is conservative by nature. They're trying to preserve the status quo. We're trying to keep things in order. By appearing on their side, it's only going to help you. It almost comes as a pleasant shock and surprise to them. Like, wow, this person we assumed was going to be all confrontational with us and counterculture actually really is just wanting to explore. Just make it out to seem that, listen, I just want to explore. If you're going to put all this political stuff behind it, and your philosophy, and you're going to seem agitated by it, like you're, you're a resistance fighter, it's not going to build well for you. These are just little tips and tricks to make life easier as a vagabond. Easy is the way to go, because we want to maximize our enjoyment on this journey of vagabonding. Yeah. So like, like, my boss, so when I went up to Alaska to work in the fishery canneries, um, after college, after I'd been an athlete for many years and was, you know, back in reality and trying to figure my way out the part became an electrician, my boss saw that I had more of like a personality of maybe confronting people or wearing my heart on my sleeve too much. And he's like, Sham, you got to wear a mask to work. You have to be able to hide, you know, your feelings and yourself to make things easier in a way that applies to everything, to vagabonding as well. When you're faced with a tough situation, these people have more power than you accept that. They have control over your life, accept that to a sense, you know. So what can you do to appease them? Wear that mask. You may you may have a full right to, to say, fuck you guys, you guys are treating me unjustly, you're stereotyping, you're racist, you're this and that. But it suits you to wear that mask uh, to make things easier to fight another day. So appear to them like they want you, like you want to try to appear to them like the most likable person, like you're relatable to them. Um, and that's why that whole trick and psychological ploy of coming across as me being maybe more conservative and pro-country of whatever you're at. Uh, and putting yourself just, I'm just a simple explorer. I'm doing this backpacking trip across the country. I have a normal life. I'm, this is my vacation time, and I'm just doing this unconventional exploring. That's it. Yeah. Right on. Kind of just like playing into the opposite of what they expect. Exactly. The pleasantly surprised is as disarming as it gets. Right on. Um, what do you see happening with r slash vagabond in the future? Do you see it going down the same uh, direction? Or do you see like r slash train hopping taking over? A very good question, man. Uh, I really appreciate you as, as being the host and interviewer. You definitely got a talent for, you know, asking questions. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, hey, you're welcome, man. Uh, I see train hop, train jumping vagabond, I mean, train jumping subreddit as growing. It'll, sorry, but it, and I think it should. It's, it's attractive and has many of the original members of Vagabond. And they're showing things more in their pure form, which is actually going out there and exploring and doing epic shit, so to speak. Vagabonding is in a weird phase. 
it's too dominated by newbies. Um, and it seems like whenever somebody wants to get real deep in philosophical, show more of the overall experience, show actual experiences, like train hopping, exploring abandoned buildings, and just overall speaking on the nature of it, it, it just doesn't get the upvotes I think it should. And of course I'm biased because I'm creating content to document my journey. And if you want to call that uh, attention seeking, well, what is all of social media in a sense? It is, there's an attention seeking aspect to it. We grew up, you know, hopefully watching Snow the Hobo and all these people. Yeah, they're posting stuff and they want it to be seen. That's attention, right? It doesn't need to have a negative connotation about it. I'm simply showing my adventures and my journey, and I'm showing the in-depth parts of it. Uh, if all it's going to be is one is is you know uh, more downtrodden and showing your food and complaining about how your feet hurt and stuff, and I, I, that's just not a way it should be headed. That is something that maybe, hey, you're going through some struggles. I appreciate you showing that. How can I help? But to repetitively see these posts, which aren't showing much, is kind of uh, discerning, you know? I really hope that maybe more of the experienced vagabonds can co come about and post more often and, and get people clued in as to like the entirety of vagabonding as opposed to just these very basic elements where you could see that shit on, you know, camping subreddit or, or a homeless subreddit. Uh, it's almost like we've turned it into a, how can I get into vagabonding subreddit uh, as opposed to really showing what it's all about. So I, at this point, I see vagabonding kind of being, the subreddit of vagabonding being pretty stagnant um, be, uh, yeah, I just, I'm going to keep posting and I do get some, I, I do get my support. So really appreciate you guys. Uh, and I, I try to be very practical about how I approach. Cause I see these posts. I'm like, I could literally post 24 times a day. I could post every hour about every little detail I'm doing. And I'm thinking, what's the point? Like, it's just, it doesn't really progress anything i'm going to try to post deeper stuff my thoughts my opinions my philosophies my train hopping my road tripping my exploring abandoned buildings things that require actual effort i believe should more so be broadcast things that have you know more substance to them should be broadcast um if you are a newbie and you're posting i appreciate that you do not overdo it uh, and if you find yourself going through some turmoil, reach out to somebody like me. Reach out to um, reach out to somebody. Talk more so in DMs. A lot of the stuff can be DMs as to, hey, you know, what's what's going on with your life? How can I help? What's what's the issue here? Uh, so I think it's just kind of what I call cheap karma when you try to make people feel sorry for your condition. Uh, Again, I, I thought most people legitimately are going through struggles and stuff like that. I just don't think the content on Vagabond subreddit should revolve around these type of things. Um, we should definitely have much more positivity and in-depthness to it. Yeah, I think the suffering kind of comes with the territory. Like, if you took, like, a population sample of r slash vagabond of the people that are actually roughing it chances are even tonight that they're just at some point not going to be comfortable you know oh for sure uh, but i mean are you saying that more in the context that it's a given so why broadcast it yeah exactly yeah okay perfect that's what i thought it's almost like dude we know this is an expected outcome. We're broadcasting the obvious. Let's try to highlight the stuff that actually makes it fun. We already know that your feet are going to hurt, that you're going to be trekking 20 miles. Uh, we, 
we understand, you know, these meals you're cooking up. Like, it's cool to show a meal here and there, but to show what you're eating five times a day over the course of weeks on end, like, it's not a food channel, you know? Yeah. It's cool, but we need to get to a point where, as a community, to, to stomp down and say, okay, awesome, like, you showed us a meal, maybe share once a week about what you ate, or if it's something very unique. If there's a tip, if there's something to be gained from it, right? If there's some sort of, like, cool hack you found to be able to get cheap food, or, or, or some easy components to be able to carry it and make up as a meal. But to just keep posting stuff um, in a simple context, is, it's overdone. Uh, if it's something like you're talking about suffering and whatnot, that's a given with the community, you're advertising the obvious. There's, it's, it's overdone. Let's get back to the actual spirit of it. Let's talk about life. Let's talk about experiences. Let's talk about tips and tricks. Let's let positivity shine. Yeah. I think there is like somewhat of a badge of honor through the suffering though cuz but it's like more so that I suffered through these experiences so I could have this one really great experience, you know. Yeah, and I think there needs to be a certain type there needs to be suffering and achievement over a period of time before that matters. If you're broadcasting yourself as a newbie who is confused and lost, what do you expect? You know? But if you're saying, listen, I've done this for a year, this is what I overcame, and you're documenting your struggles over the course of a year to show, hey, this is the fruit of my labor, that's a cool concept. It shows the ability to overcome. There's, there's something to benefit from. But what do you expect if you've just gotten into it and you're, you're experiencing suffering? Like, there's not much to offer there. It's like you were talking about before. Um, like, what do you expect again? Uh, so I like to kind of chronicle a longer journey before you broadcast so much of that. Because a very cool video concept is to say, listen, I was very inexperienced. Look at all this stuff I went through. I fought through it. I overcame. I learned this. Show your learning. I mean, show that you're learning. And then, boom, I had this glorious experience. I want to share it with you guys. There's a sense of progression that's positive. It's moving things forward. It's, it's interesting. Um, that's kind of what I want to get more into. Is, uh, and also kind of having more of the experienced members pitch in with, with that kind of deeper content, which is why I'm starting to post more of my quotes, which I, you know, I'm extracting from this podcast, uh, which I appreciate you for doing that and for being able to share, you know, our, uh, interactions and kind of have i just want something deeper man i think vagabonding should be a spiritual experience uh and we should be able to kind of gain something from that that we can you know take on to the phase of i believe returning back to society like i say this is not natural progress it shouldn't be a lifestyle it's something that you should be able to benefit from so that you can overall benefit your entire existence moving forward. Yeah, for sure. What do you see the uh, steps to getting back to normal society looking like? For me, it's really weird. It's 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 weird to think about. Um, it's kind of overwhelming at times. I would say. Because being a licensed electrician, being part of a union, the IBW, um, I think, like I was mentioning before, I'm not going to settle until my soul, my soul feels settled, and I still feel like I need to experience more things in terms to in, in terms of extracting more lessons from them. So obviously, it would be to um, you know get get a place 
the final destination where I feel like I'm going to settle, which I believe in Las Vegas. Um, get back into making money, getting a car, and then, you know, getting back into the union and starting back as an electrician. Um, and it's a weird reintroduction because that's a very intense field to be a trained, to be a skilled laborer, to be a tradesman is something, you know, that's, it's, it's tough to do. You know, I've been there, done that. And then to have my ambitions of running projects and whatnot, we're talking about years of building. But I go back to stoicism and I try not to take things beyond the first step. And the first step for me right now is just existing, is waiting for that phone call to go to Oregon and to continue exploring. Once I feel like my soul wants to settle, then I'll focus on let me get a place of residence, let me get a home, let me save up for a car, tools, all that stuff, and then uh, ease into the electrical field and talk to my each employer about my situation where I came from because I want somebody who's understanding. I want somebody who understands that I came from being homeless and being a vagabond and that I want to rebuild and that I want a viable future and I want somebody who's help me and invest in me. Um, but I'm thankful that I'm a single guy with no dependents. I don't have kids or anything like that. And I'm willing to go anywhere in the U.S., anywhere on Earth to realize my dream of, of being a foreman, of being a project manager and whatnot. Um, so right now, I'm just really focused on my journey. But I do look ahead, and like I say, it's overwhelming at points. But I've already been there, done that, you know. Um, it's just really a matter of when I'm going to pull the trigger. And I think being a vagabond, doing it the right way, in my opinion, addressing mental health and... Coming from that background, I came from approaching it a certain way um, has given me a lot of confidence in, in myself as well. And that way, I'm able to say, listen, I'm putting my head down. I'm only going to deal with people moving forward in my life who are understanding and supportive. That's it. I'm only going to deal with people who are understanding and supportive moving forward in life. I'm not going to shortchange myself. Because when you don't have confidence, when you don't, when you don't have untreated, when you have untreated mental health issues, you're going to kind of put yourself lower. But for me, that's empowering. Um, and I believe that's what vagabonding should be. It should empower you to say, listen, I'm a tough person. I've been able to go through all these circumstances. Uh, and ultimately, it's going to make me a better person. Right on. What uh, what do you expect the road to have for you next? Like going to Oregon or where you're at now? Um, my intention is to is to start doing more urban exploring. So abandoned buildings, I explore alone usually at night. That's like my throat is big. I kind of want to get back more into that, although. I have so much footage, like I haven't posted even half of what I have, uh, which puts me at ease in a sense, maybe it's like complacency or whatever, and I want to get back into doing more of that, which I fully intend to. So wherever I travel to, I'm going to settle in a destination for a period of time to be able to to explore massive abandoned buildings and document that. Um, train hopping, guaranteed, is something I want to do more of, so it's a train hopping and exploring abandoned buildings. And then we were talking earlier today about like urban climbing and stuff like that. And that's kind of the last element I want to try to add is climbing cranes, but I'm going to do so with safety equipment. Uh, I'm not that brave when they're skilled or whatever. I just don't think it's worth risking your life um, climbing things just to be able to fall and die. Uh, but I do want to add that content because when I was, Way back in the day before I became a vagabond, when I was watching these videos, it was urban exploring, urban camping, abandoned buildings, whatever, and it started introducing urban climbing, such as cranes, and I was intrigued by that. 
coincidentally, Seattle has the most crazy innovation, maybe North America, and it'd be a really cool thing to at least do it once where I can go up and climb a crane and uh, be able to live that, live through those people that, you know, I would say saved my life. Those YouTubers, you know, like Stove and Shiny, you know, you mentioned Vagrant Holiday, uh, Hobo Shoestring, Right Out on the Rail, things like that. Um, and kind of complete my adventure in a sense. So I think that'd be a really nice thing. And we're talking about hitchhiking as well, which I've, I've always been resistant to. I think just because I've done so much road tripping, I'm like, what's the appeal in being in a car, especially if you're not in control of it? But you made some very good points earlier about the social you know, aspect of it and whatnot. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe I want to at least do one hitchhike to get that out of the way. So there's this checklist I kind of have uh, before I want to seriously plan to move on to the next step of integrating with society. My thing with hitchhiking, I would say, it's just, it seems, from my perspective, again, case by case basis, it's bland because I've driven across 40 states. I've been to 40 states and I've been able to trace my own path. It's like here you are, um, being relegated to somebody else's whim. Uh, and also, what's to say that the encounter is not going to be bad or awkward or whatever? Uh, because I'm somebody who, maybe I think a lot of vagabonds can relate to this. I don't really get along with very many people because I expect a certain amount of depth. So for me to be say, sitting in a passenger seat being taken to whatever their destination, I'm like, I don't really see too much appeal. I could be train hopping or, or whatever. You know, the, the, the fact is that at that point, I'm just trying to get from A to B. But again, the good point you mentioned is somebody who's going to be taking you off is more likely going to be on the same wavelength. Um, and there could be potential for some great connections there. And that's why I think maybe you convinced me that I may very well try to do it at least one time. So I appreciate you at least uh, sharing that and opening up my mind. And although I'm going to just fully admit hitchhiking from day one, just it just is not, it's not something that I feel like if I missed that on, it'd be something that'd be like nagging at me. Well, I'm glad I uh, gave you some inspiration to try it out. I think uh, yeah. with the hitchhiking it's more i don't know the like the appeal for me is you're kind of letting the chips fall as they may you know it's really up to uh, what's going on around you to make things happen and there's also that aspect of the person that's picking you up either wants to tell you their life story or they want to hear yours or they want to tell you about exactly. how jesus is our lord and savior and how you can turn your life around. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, I would say for sure, it's it's all about the potential interaction that uh, should kind of make you do it. So, yeah, I appreciate you showing, you know, like sharing that aspect of it because I didn't think too deeply about it, for sure. Even, like, the negative experiences, too. Like, um, I don't know if you know Channel 5 with Andrew Callahan. It's like kind of like broadcasting, but in a way somewhat like satirical at the same time. Like so just the way they of, edit it. He's not part of an official, is he part of like the official news or just pretending to kind of be? Uh, no, it's just like a YouTube channel. It's not anything like backed by uh, a network or anything. Like an SNL skit? No, no, no. It's like the just a dude that goes to like different like Trump rallies or like satanist <laughs> conventions or like sex shows or something and he just interviews people but he usually just says so uh what's on your mind and then like people just let go and like say whatever is on their mind so he gets some pretty crazy yeah. content like that um but he was saying once he was hitchhiking and he was at this truck stop and some dude picked him up but i guess he thought he was like a lot lizard or something like that so he took him to like this theater that just had like 
porn playing and they're just a bunch of dudes all watching porn together and like even that when he talks about it he was like i was kind of uncomfortable but it was also like just a crazy experience to have you know like some people do this and it's not even abnormal for them you know well, no, I mean, that brings up a great point, because I mentioned earlier that part of the appeal, in a weird way, is wishing that things go sideways, because now you're forced to react, um, and it's going to come up as a memorable experience. So, yeah, actually, for some crazy reason, that makes me want to get more <laughs> out of all the stories that you can, you know, come up with. Uh, from doing all of that. So, absolutely, I, I totally agree. And then I'm more so... Now motivated to do it more than ever for sure. And he was saying too, the guy was nice about it. Like once he realized that, like the like buddy he picked up wasn't trying to like do anything like or get weird. He was like, "Oh, okay, like my bad. I seems like we've got a misunderstanding. Like I'll drive you the rest of the way. I'm going, and we can be on our way." Yeah, but- the the one time, let's see, on Reddit, this truck driver reached out to me that we just met at, like, in McDonald's and chatted, but he was more so curious about the, like, the vagabond culture and stuff like that. But that would have been a cool experience to say, hey, I'm going to accompany, accompany you on your truck drive from Ohio to NYC or something like that. Um that definitely opened up new experiences, so I got to look at it more from that uh, lens, I would say, for sure. I think I'm just more looking at it as, hey, I'm going to be a passenger, drive, like having a driver when I've already been like a huge road tripper and, and what's the appeal. But no, the appeal is more so on the social aspect and just a uh, chance of a wild experience, which makes for great stories. And I think in the end, that's what's going to survive is, is your stories and memories. Yeah, for sure. And I'd say, too, that, like, a lot of the memorable experiences are when it's from, like, the other person wanting to do stuff, because that's how you really get exposed to things. Exactly, because as a hitchhiker, you're thinking, I just want to get here. That's That's, like, the end all be all is drop me off at this destination but in a way the exciting part is what is the other person's uh, take on things um, and, and really it's the other person making the experience which is a cool concept because it's forcing you um, to experience new things yeah yeah for sure there's uh, another podcast to uh, Voice of Gord, and that's a uh, trucker up in you Canada. Yeah, and he uh, has an episode. It's like over three hours, I think. But it's he has like a round table with a bunch of dudes that have done like hitchhiking and train hopping and all sorts of vagabonding. And he himself has done it too. And one dude was saying that one time he got picked up by a truck that was just full of uh, native guys. And then they like were like, oh yeah, get in, like no worries. And then he was just lying in the back, they gave him a beer and he was just lying on top of a bunch, like two or three other native dudes just drinking a beer and they were asking him, what tribe are you from? And he was just a really tanned white guy and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm a white dude. And then they all just started laughing and were like, no, you're, you're you're fucking with us, like, you're, what tribe are you from, you know, but he was just hitchhiking and out in the sun so much that he was tanned enough that they thought he was native. Yeah, and like, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, that shit, you just can't, can't, can't do any other way, funny as hell. Uh, you mentioned also, like, David Cho, I saw the, a little bit about him on Joe Rogan, and then, um, like, his graffiti stuff at Facebook and whatnot. And, and uh, that was another intriguing aspect of seeing somebody like that, you know, road trip to so many different places. And it's a totally different experience. And again, the more I hear about it, the more I definitely think I have to at least do it once. Just like with my train hop. And like, as long as you do something once, you can forever say that you've done it. Um, 
and I'm trying to have the most diverse experience, combine all these things that I've seen, again, before I've ever been in the this, watching all these different content creators uh, doing their thing, I still feel like, hey, you know, I got to do urban climbing and um, hitchhiking to maybe feel more complete sense. So again, appreciate you for sharing that and kind of encouraging those experiences because it's more than just, I'm going to go to this destination and I need somebody to take me there and that's it. Like there could be very well, some buck wild stuff and uh, it sounds like something for sure. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking out the uh, Thumbs Up show from David Cho. That's, it's a pretty wild experience to to watch. It's one of my like go-to comfort shows. Definitely. Uh, you mentioned, okay, this, this Gord guy, because I was talking about, so I'm in the process of trying to get into Canada. Uh, I had my stuff stolen in terms of my documents a couple of years ago in Vegas in the parking garage when I first got there, uh, I just got my birth certificate the other day, ordered it, uh, so I have my birth certificate finally. And a social security card, I'm going to have to go into the office and get that. So between those two, I'm looking at the best way to be entry into Canada, and it's like passport, obvious. Um, but that can take between two or three months. Real ID here in America. I think we're all going to be required to get it um, pretty soon. So I think maybe that's the best route. What's that? Uh, Real, Real ID? ID. What? Yeah, it's called Real ID. Okay, I, I haven't heard of that. What is that? It's like, yeah, it's, it's like an enhanced driver's license or id card and it allows you to travel across the border but you need to prove more things um so you need to have certain documents you know, your birth certificate social security card and i think a couple other stuff and it's a quicker process um so i'm looking at doing that um but also i'm not discounting the fact of trying to enter the border illegally you know yeah, uh, and there's almost a, there's like an excitement about that too, as well. In a way, it's almost like I wish I'm hoping to fail so that I, I'm forced into this desperation, which I think would make a great experience and video as well. And then when I asked you about it, and I've asked a couple people, when you mentioned this Gord guy in terms of trying to like sneak into Canada, I, I still have to go back on a text and uh, review that to be able to see you know, kind of his outtake on, his outlook on that. But I just kind of wanted to know your general idea on, you know, getting yourself illegally across the border. Because obviously, we've got these cartels since their inception doing this on a regular basis. So it's not out of the question, but kind of what his, you know, whole approach is. Yeah, so uh, with the voice like, of like Gord... Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Like, if you were... If you... If I asked you, how can I get into Canada illegally, in your entirety of your knowledge on that, what would be something you would tell me for a listener? And we're not encouraging it, first of all. We're not encouraging it. This is just like a hypothetical situation. Uh, well, I'm encouraging it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, then I am too. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, from the voice of Gord, what I found interesting was on that podcast, and I'll send you the link to it, was that dudes were saying okay. that they were looking at train hopping over the border, but they were worried about body scanners, and that, like, they yeah, have, yeah, like, the x-rays. yeah, x-rays and, like, heat signatures or something like that and uh the guy's philosophy was pretty much there's so much information coming to the people monitoring that at all times that i'm just gonna send it and chances are they'll just look over it and won't even notice me and he said he did it a few times and it worked out so he didn't have issues taking a train up here um just topping oh, okay. it like 
I don't know if it was intermodal. He might have, like, done the grainers or something like that. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, he didn't say specifically, but... Pardon? Yeah. Um, no, sorry about that. I'm just kind of trying to, like, you know, vocalize my internal thoughts. Thinking about that, but yeah, it's a good philosophy in terms of just send it, but uh, continue. Yeah, I think he, like, he didn't say specifically what car he took, but he was talking about the grainers earlier in the episode, and how they have, like, those holes that you can hide in. So if you're trying to, like, yeah, yeah. get across a sneakier area, that might be the way to go compared to a, uh, just a intermodal, like, where you're sitting on the porch yeah, there. Yeah. And then, um, I talked to a dude, too, that was on the run for a few years that used to train hop, and he was <laughs> saying that, uh, if you climb into, like, the gondolas, like, if they have a load, even if it's, like, coal or whatever, if even if they stop the train and check it, what are the chances that someone's gonna actually climb up, like, the side of every yeah. car and look into it? So that's another good exactly. bet. And then, um, also the... So, the cartels down in Mexico, so they have, like, this service that's, uh, Coyotes. So, they'll get you across the border so you can, like, go to the U.S. and have a better life, I guess. And, uh, mm -hmm. one of the ways they do that, so they obviously do it across the, like, U.S. or the Mexico-Texas border in that whole area. Pardon? Yep. And the, like I've seen, um, I've seen a lot of uh, documentaries where they're taking people across the, the river. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like the Rio Grande, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they another way they do it too is they'll fly people up to Canada and then just have them walk down. Um, a lot of it's done like in the uh, BC Alberta area because. That whole area, the border is just a stretch of forest with like a cut out hundred meter strip to mark the border. And same with Quebec too. There's areas where you can like walk into the U.S. and not even know it. Like people have been charged for going to the grocery store, but it ended up being on the U.S. side. Well, the, the, the thing is, like, I can I listen to the Corky Borky interview, and he talks about walking across where I'm, I'm close to, and a couple hours away from that, like, East Park or whatever it is, and he was caught on the U.S. side. But I guess that's easier because if you have U.S. documents, they will be like, okay, cool, like, you're a U.S. citizen. But I, I'm trying to do it in reverse. That's something I was looking at. And then uh, you guys also talked about Winnipeg. And you mentioned that stretch, you know, there's not a very long stretch of, like, surveillance um, in that area. So I was also, like, Google satellite viewing that, that portion as well. And then I also saw a documentary a couple of years ago on, like, Roxbury. I think it's in New York. And these African immigrants would take the Greyhounds, and it's a random small city in New York, up north, and walk across the border. Um, in order to get entry to Canada. So, yeah, it's definitely doable. I'm just kind of wanting to brainstorm potential, like, last resort ideas, but it's very cool to, to be able to get as many resources uh, as possible to uh, to find out information on that, for sure. So, yeah, that's definitely intriguing. I almost wish or hope that I do it, quote-unquote, illegally, because uh, I think it makes for just a better experience overall. Yeah. That's definitely one on the bucket list for me, too. I just think it would be, like, a cool experience. But the only shitty thing for me is, like, okay, so I'm working to gain funds to continue my journey, and part of that journey is to go to Canada, but I know that once I get into Canada, I can't legally work, and that's kind of, like, a little bit of a stressor uh, in terms of, like, how would I be able to make money in Canada as... An, an illegal alien, you know? It would be weird to call myself that, 
but that that is what I would do in Canada. Um, yeah, I'd suggest, like, looking on either, like, Facebook groups or stuff like Kijiji, because you can always find random cash jobs, but even yeah, that exactly. would be kind of stressful, too, to an extent, because you never know when work's gonna come up. Um, also, yeah. like, spanging would work all the same up here as it would down there. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm also assuming that the like Canadian aid organizations or Canadian like homeless services would be the type that doesn't like ask many questions. So it'd be like easy to get food and stuff like that if you really need it, right? Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have issues. Like you could just go there and say you don't have your ID and I've never run into one that said that you can't stay here, you know? Unless you're, like, clearly, like, having a mental episode or something like that, I'm where sure you're, I'm like, machete. pardon? I'm saying, I'm just joking, if I showed up with a machete and just... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
might be an issue. I don't even know, though, if they could have, like, a system that... Because if you present, even if you present your documents, right, I don't know if there's, like, something telling them that, okay, this guy crossed the border or not, or, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's so, there's so many, um, like, self-limiting rules, it seems to be that you might as well take a chance, and, and um, a lot of times things are in your favor, you just, you just never know to try. Yeah. Stobe has a pretty good video of uh, going into Canada. You know, I, saw, I saw his train hop. That was one of the most epic trips, but um, I don't think he did it illegally, did he? In the video, they said that they took the Amtrak up. But also, I don't know, because he was saying at one point in the video, this is like the quote that sticks out to me is that he was with Wingman, like his partner in crime there yeah, with train hopping. Yeah, and he was saying that he has just enough criminal experience to keep us safe, but not <laughs> enough to prevent us from entering Canada legally. So, I don't know, I though. Remember I, I remember that quote, yeah. You just never know. But <laughs> I guess it's good in a way to maybe not document that for him. Um, but the fact, the thing with me is like, if anything's been done once, it can be done again. Um, and um, I think I'm savvy enough to be able to figure that out. Right now I'm just trying to go about the, the legal route. But like I say, if, if not, then whatever. But truthfully, I'm just waiting to go to Oregon. And once Oregon frees me up, then I'll look at what the document process is in and decide, you know, the, the urgency level I need to, to, to go there and proceed. Yeah. I feel like, too, it's not like one of those borders where people are actively on the lookout. Maybe at, like, one or two yeah. spots that are just known. Like, I know in, like, Quebec, there's a road that is pretty well known for people, like, trying to migrate. And I've seen videos where the cops will be like, if you cross this area, like, we'll have to arrest you and process you or whatever. That's Roxbury. Yeah. Think, well, that's a, that's a Roxbury, that, that's a northern New York uh, stop. Yeah. They, they, typically, they typically greyhound African immigrants, too, and then the cops are waiting there. Um, it's, not, it's not to sound cocky. But I think I have enough experience um, and kind of like overall toughness to be able to do it because it's like these are relatively basic people who are, who are doing this and they've gotten across, you know. Um, so I definitely think you know, there shouldn't be any issues. I'm just kind of trying to formulate the best path to do it. And I prefer, you know, to, to kind of try the legal route for whatever reason, uh, because I'm able to access the documents, and if not, I don't really have any reservations doing it. However, so by, by being like, hey, there's these smugglers and these immigrants trying to get in when they do, uh, it gives me that much more confidence that I'm able to do it. Um, so, like I say, in a sick way, I always kind of wish for the worst case scenario, because of the reactions from it, the experience, um, I think is the best case scenario. You're just never able to have it any other way. Those stories are going to live forever. Yeah. I think, like, the safest way if you wanted to do it would be the, uh, like, out west and just spending a few days out in the woods, just, like, trekking and getting up there. And if you're in Seattle, that shouldn't be far at all, actually. No, no, no. I was going to say, I'm three, four hours from the border. I could eat, like, if that's a super cheap, I could go to Blaine, Washington, and scout up the area. Um, that's why, for me, really, the only holdup is I want to, you know, pay respects to, to my friend's mother and go to Oregon and spend some time there. 
and then from there, it's whatever. So I'm kind of in this weird purgatory, but once that frees up, I'm totally open to, you know, going up there and camping and scouting it out myself. Or, I mean, ultimately, I want to go to Calgary, so maybe I might move to, uh, like, a, an American city that's closer to the border there and scout that out, but I'm not opposed to any of that. Although, yeah, winter is coming up, but again, diversity of experience, I've done negative 40 Fahrenheit till 120 Fahrenheit outside. Uh, so I really, I don't have any regulations. I, I really believe I'm as tough as they come. And again, everything is an experience. So that's why, in a sick way, I do hope for worst case scenario, it tests me as a person and it opens up all these different avenues. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. The cold's not really uh, all fun and games, though. It can get pretty bad. Oh, no, no. I, I absolutely agree with you. But I I mean, I've been out there in sub zero enough times in Chicago. And yeah, you do start to hate your flight. You question your own sanity. But if you're prepped, you're thinking, like, this freaking baby surviving in Siberia. So, again, I try to draw confidence from seeing the fact that there's only people surviving in these elements. And if they can do it, why the fuck can I not? It's, it, I think you have to have a certain confidence as a vagabond to maximize the experience. You need to have full belief in yourself and also be smart enough to um, plan a backup option. You should always be able to, you know, open to contact people, even if it's going to get you in trouble. Just like if you're train hopping, if you're freaking about to die at first, there should be nothing within you saying, hey, let me walk to the front and talk to the conductor. Yeah, maybe I might be arrested, but it's going to save my life. Um, so that's just how I approach things. I think you've got to have a main plan, you've got to have a backup plan, and you don't have to be afraid of getting in trouble. Yeah, that's some pretty good advice. I, I think I also gained confidence in that being a licensed electrician, being part of the union, you're in a blue-collar space. It's not going to disqualify me for future work. It, if anything, it's going to make a funny-ass job site story. You know, like, this dude's insane. He freaking tried to sneak into Canada in a sub-zero weather, and he got arrested and deported and stuff, like, for me, I look at it as hilarious as hell. I'm just in that scenario that it's not going to affect me overall. If anything, it's going to add to my experience. So I'm, I'm very thankful and fortunate. I worked my ass off to do it, to put myself in that situation, but, yeah, like I say, it's, it's not going to affect me overall, which is why I'm more willing to take risks I don't think you should base your experience off me if you're watching me on social media. Again, I really appreciate it, but don't take it for granted. This is not kind of the, the relaxed approach you generally should take. Yeah, right on. Are there uh, any final words you wanted to say before we wrap it up? Well, I would say just, you know, if you'd like, if you're curious, tune into my social media on my YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Reddit. Search I am Shan the Man. So I A M S H A N the Man, all one word. And then Google Shan, S H A N, Belt Magazine to see an article. Obviously, you have to tune into this podcast, the Dream Base podcast. Um, I think it's the most real place for actual vagabond experiences. Um, and just continue following my journey. I definitely am planning to appear here if you'd like more often. I mean, as often as you'd like. And just continue updating the journey. I think vagabonds need to return more so to listening to people who've been there, done that, as opposed to just advertising downtroddenness and struggling. Uh, and just keep things positive. This is supposed to be good. You're supposed to have something from it, to gain something from it. Uh, and realize that we always have people to lean on, and don't be afraid to reach out. 
And that concludes episode 23 of the Moonbase podcast. I hope you enjoyed. It's always great having Sham on. And make sure you go check out his stuff. I'll link them in the description of the video so you guys can find his content as well. And uh, stay tuned for episode 24. I'm going to try a new format. Um... <clears throat> Still going to be doing interviews and stuff, but I also uh, want to try something new because I always go down rabbit holes, and I, I was thinking of calling it like the rabbit hole review. I'm just going to like go over what I did a deep dive on. So recently, my most recent rabbit hole I went down through was gold prospecting, and I'm actually working on trying to gold prospect at the moment i got like a some land and permission to try to pan for gold and i was looking into sluices although the legality of that is iffy i might have to get a license if i end up going with a sluice so so far i'm just panning um another cool rabbit hole i went down was uh 3d printed guns and like ghost guns uh, very interesting stuff. If you know me, you know that I enjoy like firearms and weapons and tinkering with them in particular. Not really like like shooting targets and stuff is fun. Don't get me wrong, but like the engineering behind it and uh, seeing how some of these guns are actually put together is wicked cool. So I want to do an episode on that as well. And yeah, I uh, think that's it, and we can wrap this up. Hope you enjoyed, and stay tuned for more.